Hello, everyone. Thank you for participating in today's AMTA Zoom meeting on defining central nervous system abnormalities in infantile and late onset Pompe disease patients. Today's guest speakers are Jamin Upadhyaya and Raquel Van Gool. Uh, Dr. Upadhyaya is a translational medicine scientist with over 15 years of experience in the neurosciences. In 2018, Dr. Upadhyaya returned to academia after spending eight years in the pharmaceutical industry. Throughout his career, he has led or co-led a multitude of investigations aimed at, aimed at validating new drug targets, validating novel, preclinical or clinical methodologies, and translating preclinical research findings into early phase clinical trials. Across translational biomarker studies, Dr. Upadhyaya has utilized his background in neuroimaging physics and systems neuroscience and integrated his no this knowledge base with his expertise in drug discovery and development. At Boston Children's Hospital, he serves as the principal investigator for clinical studies evaluating central nervous manifestations in patients with lysosomal storage diseases, such as Pompeii and Neiman Pitt type C. Dr. Van Duel is a researcher and PhD candidate at the Department of Anesthesiology, Critical Care, and Pain Medicine at Boston Children's Hospital and School for Mental Health and Neuroscience at Maastricht University of the Netherlands. She completed a bachelor's program in psychology, followed by a research master's program in cognitive and clinical neuroscience with a specialization in pharmaceutical development, during which she worked for several months with Boston Children's Hospital, researching neuropathic conditions and lysosomal storage diseases. Raquel's current focus is on the characterization of neurological manifestations of lysosomal storage diseases, particularly in Pompe disease and Neiman Pitt type C, as a member of Dr. Upadhyaya's research team. And with that, I'd like to welcome Dr. Er Raquel Van Buhl to uh, begin her presentation. Thank you. All right, thank you for the introduction and welcome everyone to our webinar titled Defining Central Nervous System Abnormalities in Infantile and Late Onset Pompe Disease. My name is Raquel, your speaker for today, and I'm here with our principal investigator of the study, Dr. Jamin. We would like to tell you more about our current research at Boston Children's Hospital and share some of our preliminary findings. And we should also have time for a little Q&A session at the end of this webinar. So before I tell you more about our study, I want to provide a brief background of the reason why we are doing this study. So over the past decade, with newborn screening of Pompeii in many states and the event of enzyme replacement therapy, we see that lives of patients with Pompeii disease have improved greatly. And patients now have better survival rates and improved quality of life, which means that there are now other symptoms that have become apparent. Because therapies do not yet treat the central nervous system effectively and because it is not yet clear how and to what extent the central nervous system must be targeted, we can say that a new central phenotype of Pompeii has emerged where we observe so-called residual symptoms. So what are these residual symptoms? Now, there are two symptom domains that affect um, patients and their caregivers quite a lot, and improving these domains would greatly improve patients' lives. Now, the first symptom domain would be cognitive functioning, some patients may have problems with their working memory or sustained attention. And there are many different subcategories of cognitive functioning that we can investigate. Now, the second symptom domain is motor functioning. And now this can be due to central nervous system deficits or um, muscle atrophy. 
Important symptoms here are swallowing difficulties, speech production deficits. Patients may have problems with mobility and fine motor movements. And so in our study, we focus on investigating these two symptom domains. So to understand the deficits in these domains better, our study has three objectives. Our first objective is to understand how the brain is related to cognitive and motor impairments. Our second objective is to find new tools or biomarkers that allow us to evaluate cognitive and motor symptoms in both infantile and late onset patients. Biomarkers are certain characteristics of, for example, the brain that may inform us on disease progression, but also treatment effects. Now, in our case, we want to see how certain characteristics relate to these symptoms, and we want these biomarkers to be safe and non-invasive ways of probing these symptom domains. And finally, we wish to integrate any new experimental measures with standard of care assessments. And for standard of care assessments, you can think of anything that is already implemented during regular checkups. Firstly, what we do all of our testing at Boston Children's Hospital, we have patients come in from all over the country and we reimburse any travel expenses, including hotels and flights. So we really do our best to make everyone as comfortable as possible during the study visit. These tasks are usually spread out over two days. So first to obtain some behavioral data related to motor and cognitive functioning. We do simple motor tasks, for example, measuring grip strength visualized here. And we do some cognitive tests on the iPad using the NIH Toolbox Cognitive Battery. They are different games that measure several aspects of cognitive functioning, such as memory or vocabulary. Um, and we also do some speech tasks to investigate speech motor production. Now, all of these tasks were selected so that every patient is able to perform all or most of these tasks so that we can investigate a broad spectrum of patients with differing symptom severity. Now, to relate these tasks to what is happening in the brain, we apply two measures of neuroimaging. The first one is functional near-infrared spectroscopy, which is measured with a cap that has lights. And I will discuss this more in depth later on, but this technique is very portable and can pretty much be done anywhere. It's very similar to wearing a swim cap, and it measures brain activity in a similar way as functional MRI. Now, we do want to see how these two techniques compare, and so we also perform structural and functional MRI. For the MRI, we also want everyone to be as comfortable as possible, so we give a nice heated blanket. We only use painless and non-invasive techniques, so we don't, do not use any contrast. And participants can watch some Netflix during most of this portion, and they also do a couple of small tasks. Now, we also look at the muscles themselves using the MRI machine, again, to look at the lower body and see how the information we get from the MRI relates to another very portable instrument called electrical impedance myography, this little device right here. And again, I will explain how this works exactly later on, but this is also a very nice bedside technology that is not invasive, but could still inform us on the integrity of the muscles. And to understand how all these different techniques and tests, um, the behavioral motor and cognitive tests, the neuroimaging and the muscle evaluation are related to symptoms, we also investigate the clinical presentation. Now, to do so, we draw a little bit of blood and urine so that we can measure biomarker levels, specifically CK and HEX4. And we also administer some questionnaire batteries on all different kinds of symptoms. So that is what a study visit looks like. We collect quite a lot of information, as you can see. So the study is spread out over two days of approximately three or four hours each. We started our study last year in August. And so today I just want to share with you what we have learned so far from all the patients and healthy controls that have come in. The study is still ongoing. And so I will just be presenting some of our preliminary data. We are very lucky to have had 10 patients come in, one infantile onset patient and nine late onset patients, and also nine matched healthy controls. So as mentioned before, these patients came to visit us at Boston Children's Hospital. 
where we did all of our testing. And so we are very grateful these patients traveled to participate in our study, and we hope to include many more patients. Um, and so our patient enrollment is currently still open. So not only do we reimburse the hotels and flights, we also provide an additional payment for participating. So for those of you who would like some more information on this process, feel free to reach out to me over email. Having said that, let's dive into the results of the behavioral assessments first. So to start out with the motor tasks, we do two walk tests, the four meter walk test and two minute walk test. We do a couple of balance tests using the foam pad shown right here. We do a grip test to measure grip strength, and we do the nine hole pegboard test to measure the dexterity for each hand, where participants grab um, one peg at a time and place them in each of the hole as fast as possible. So important to note here is that we are also very flexible when it comes to administering these tasks. So depending on a patient's ambulatory and fine motor capabilities. So if some tasks cannot be administered, that's also totally okay. It will still provide us a lot of information. So what did we see in patients? Well, first of all, we saw quite a high variability in motor functioning. Some patients perform quite okay. Others do not perform very well, but overall, it was clear that patients here, shown in blue, generally perform worse than the healthy controls here, shown in yellow. Um, this is the example of the grip strength test, but we see similar patterns in um, all of the other motor tasks as well. And these results are fully corrected for several factors, such as age and gender and level of education, so that we can best compare the performance of each participant with the healthy controls as well. So that's for the motor tasks. For the cognitive assessments for which we use the iPad, um, we use seven different kinds of tasks. They measure different aspects of cognitive functioning. And this way we can look at performance on specific subcategories as well, such as attention, um, memory, language capabilities, and processing speed. And in this way, investigate more specific differences between healthy controls and patients. So about the results for these, we indeed see that patients show deficits in some cognitive domains. For example, in the language test here on the left, again, patients shown in blue, healthy controls in yellow, and in processing speed here on the right. So this is already very interesting preliminary data. Now we also administer batteries of self-reported questionnaires that inform us on physical, mental, and social well-being. The first one being the promise battery, the second one, the neuro quality of life battery. We already see that the patients in our cohort show higher levels of anxiety and depressive symptoms. These questionnaire batteries also provide information on some other aspects of life, such as communication abilities or swallowing difficulties. And so it will be very interesting to explore the other symptoms too and see how these all relate to our other findings. Now, for the results of our neuroimaging assessments, we use two techniques to look at what happens in the brain. And I want to start with our functional near infrared spectroscopy, or also called FNIRS. Um, so this cap shown here is a technique that measures brain activity in a similar way as functional MRIs do. So by looking at the oxygen in blood flow by using near infrared light in this case. So every channel that you see here, these little round caps, these are all optodes or light sources, and they can give us more information about the brain activity in each little specific region. Um, unlike MRI scanners, this technology is very portable. Um, it's also a lot cheaper, and it is also not as sensitive to movement. And so it's a lot easier to use with children, and that is something that we would also like to still explore more in the future. Now that new one screening can identify Pompeii disease patients, we hope that FNIRS can tell us a lot more about what is happening in the brain of the very youngest patients. Now, the only downside to this technique is that it can only measure the activation at the surface. And so we administer both FNIRS and MRI 
um, to also see how they relate to each other. Now, one of the tasks that we let participants do while wearing this FNIRS cap is the zookeeper task, which is made to be done by both children and adults. And because the task involves a simple button press, some of our most severely affected patients were also able to do this. And so we can get data from a whole wide range of patients. So the task here is that all the animals in the zoo have escaped and you need to help zookeeper Melissa catch all of them. Now you do have some helper friends, which are the orangutans. So you want to press the button for every animal except for the orangutan. So this is what it looks like. So the game starts out black with a cross on the screen. And now we see a bear, so we press. Our next animal is the red panda. We keep pressing the button. And now it's one of our helper friends and we do not press the button. Now these images change rapidly. And so we really have to control our impulse of wanting to press the button. So what do we see when we analyze the data? of this FNIRS cap during the game, you can see that patients show less activation in the prefrontal brain when they have to control their impulses, um, less so than healthy controls do. And here, the red color, that means activation. Um, so this is one example, but when looking at more patients, we see similar patterns. So the healthy controls on top here, they show more red, indicating they are engaging their brain more during this task. On the bottom, we see that patients show not as much activity when having to control their impulse of wanting to press the button on the orangutans. So we saw there's a difference in overall activation, but we can also look at every single subregion. So each channel on this cap receives its own signal. You can see the wire for every channel go someplace where it connects with a computer. And so we can compare every signal in every region between patients and healthy controls too. So when looking at this specific subregion right here, which is called the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex, we can see that for all subjects combined, an interesting trend so far when they were performing this impulse control task. So the healthy controls um, were indeed showing more activation than our patients do meaning that the patient group has trouble with engaging this specific area during this task. So we also looked at initial links between cognitive measures and the brain activity, um, if you remember the iPad tests. And what we found is that some, um, the same brain regions that were differently activated in patients compared to healthy controls also correlated with performance on a working memory test. So patients who were able to engage this specific part of the brain better, so a performance more like healthy controls, also did better on this working memory test. They would get a higher score on the test. And this is important because we do not only measure how the brain is different, but this also provides a foundation for identifying neurological biomarkers that could be important in the future for monitoring patients or possibly treatment effects um, across a spectrum of patients. Now, the second task that uh, we play with the FNIRS cap on is the Stroop task, which is um, a word color matching game, basically. So the words and colors can either be matching, such as here, where the word red is also in the color red, the word green in the color green and so forth. And then the words and colors could also not match where the word red is written in purple, for example. So this is a lot more difficult because it is easy to confuse the color of the word with what we automatically read. So what do we see when we compare healthy controls and patients? Now, in the healthy control here, we see that they engage their brain quite a lot, just like we saw in a zookeeper task. And this patient here did not engage their brain as much during this task. And this is again, something that we can also see in the other participants. The healthy controls here on top, they show some red spots right there. So more activation. Other patients on the other hand, show some small activation too, such as right here. 
um, but also decreases in activation, which is shown in blue. So the red is activation and the blue is deactivation. So we can also, again, look at what happens in specific subregions. Um, so for that one channel, um, the right dorsolateral prefrontal cortex. So this is the right area because it's as if we are looking um, at a participant right now. Um, we again see a trend of patients engaging this brain region less when processing the mismatched words. So when the red is written in purple, for example, um, whereas in healthy controls, this specific subregion appear, appears to be engaged more. So we hope to see more specific differences for other channels too, so that we can see which brain areas behave differently in patients. And for this task, we can also measure other important information, such as their reaction time or how many correct responses were given. And we saw that longer reaction times um, during this word color matching task were associated with, with more activity in some subregions. So this is in um, a different region here. And so the longer the patients took to respond, the more this specific brain subregion was engaged. And this is very interesting to see also how other subregions might also be differentially engaged when we compare patients and healthy controls. So when we look at the brain activation of different subregions and the performance on the cognitive tests, we can see that more activation in these earlier subregions that we saw are associated with better cognitive performance on two tests. So a higher score here is a better performance. And so we see that patients with higher activation in that specific area have higher scores on the executive functioning test shown here on the left. And the same happens with higher scores on the processing speed test. And again, we hope that this information can help with monitoring patients or finding initial treatment effects in the future. So that's about FNIRS. Now we do want to see how this data of also these cognitive tasks um, overlap with a more established method, which is the MRI scanner. The functional MRI measures brain activity in a similar way by measuring oxygen in blood flow as well. So one of the tasks that we let people do is um, the NBAC task. So while they are inside the MRI scanner, they are holding a grip that has a button that they can press. And the NBAC task consists of two parts. The zero back task, we also like to call it to, we also like to call it the spot the X um, because participants have to press the button when, while they see the X on the screen. And there's also the one back task where they have to press the button when they see the letter twice in a row. So here's what that looks like. So we get the instructions that we will do spot the X. So the first letter is not an X, we do not press the button. And again, no X, no button press. And here we go. Now we press the button as fast as possible. Okay, so now we get the instructions to do the one back task. So this is the first letter. This one's not the same as the one we saw before. So we don't press the button. We don't press the button. And then here we have the letter E again. So we need to press the button. And again, this is quite um, rapid in the MRI scanner as well. So when we look at what happens in the brain during this task, um, we can see that patients, again, show less overall activation but also that the activation is not as strong. So the yellow hotspots that we see here um, means that the activation is very strong and we do not see similar hotspots in this patient's brain. So not, not only is there less overall activation, it's also not as strong. So what do we see when we look at more um, participants? Well, we see a similar pattern as well. So the healthy controls on top show more of these hotspots and they're also larger compared to our patients. Now, interestingly, we see a trend of patients responding a little bit faster, um, but also a trend of them making more mistakes during these tasks. 
So for our analysis, we do still want to dive deeper into which brains are differently engaged between healthy controls and patients and see how different activity might be related to any other symptoms. Now we can also look at the brain when they do not have to do a task. Even when you are not doing anything, the brain never shuts off. So different brain regions are still talking to each other and understanding how these different brain regions are connected while you're just resting can tell us also a lot about which brain networks might behave differently. So in this, um, in this example right here, we can see that um, these two brain regions behave the same way over time. And so their signal is connected, meaning these two brain regions are connected and form a network together. And now what do we tell you while you're doing this part of the MRI? Um, we tell you to stay completely still, keep your eyes open and look at the cross. And you are welcome to just let your mind wander while you're inside the MRI, as long as you keep your eyes open. Now, what do we see when we compare patients in healthy controls while they're just resting? we can see that patients show a different connectivity between several brain regions. And these are connections that are related to spatial cognition and physiomotor functioning, but also motor control. So it's very interesting that we see different connectivity again in these cognitive and motor domains. Now, we can not only look at the activity in the brain, we can also look at the brain itself. So using the structural MRI, we can study the brain morphology or the thickness and volume of regions in the brain. Now these changes take some time to take place. And so this technique can show us how some regions develop over time. We can look at the thickness of the gray matter, which is the outer layer of the brain. But we can also look deeper in the brain and look at volumes of deeper structures. So these are the structures that um, are, for example, what the FNIRs can not look at, the cap that we looked at earlier. So if you remember, the patients in our cohort showed higher levels of anxiety and depressive symptoms, so keep that in mind. And well, thanks to a number of other brain imaging studies in different patient populations, we know that some brain regions are impacted in clinical levels of anxiety and depression. So what we're starting to see is that in Pompeii disease patients, these brain regions also seem to be implicated. We see that patients show differences in the nucleus accumbens, which is involved in cognition, motivation and action, as well as pain and mood. And another region that has a different structure in patients is the insula which is a region that is on the outer layer of the brain as well, but it's kind of hidden underneath some other layers that fold over the insula. And this region is also involved in pain and mood. So at first sight, we can already see some similarities between what happens in the brain and what problems patients experience. So now that we see these connections between Account. pain Sorry, yes. I think you have a question. Sorry, I didn't want to. Oh, no problem. Yeah. I, can you read out the question? Because I cannot see the Q&A from my side. Um, I think Jennifer Matthews has a question for you. Yeah. I just see a hand raised for Jenny Math Jennifer Matthews. Hi. Uh, okay, so questions need to be typed in to the Q&A box down yeah. below. Okay. Okay. And uh, we can go ahead and cover them at the end if that works for everybody. That was supposed to be part of my intro, I'm sorry. No problem. Um, yeah, I could also just come back to the questions at the end, that's no problem. Oh, I see that the question was a mistake. That's okay. okay. But maybe the question from Ryan Colbert, uh, oh. we can uh, talk about it at the end if that's okay. Yeah. Right. Ryan, we'll make sure we get that uh, question answered. Will do. Okay, so yeah, we see that the connections between pain and mood, um, as well as other aspects of the disease at the group level um, exists. And so I want to share with you a case report that our team published two weeks ago, 
And in this case report, we also look at an individual patient whose medical history highlights how important it is to look at the complete picture of the disease and to treat all symptoms holistically. So last year we had a very young patient come into Boston Children's Hospital and um, they told us that when they were very young, approximately five or six years old, before their Pompe diagnosis, um, this patient had pain in their feet, which was initially attributed to growing pains. Now, around the same time, this patient was diagnosed with ADHD, oppositional defiant disorder, and disruptive mood dysregulation disorder. So this patient was very irritable um, at that point in time, but this was not connected to the pain um, during this, in this year. And then over the next two years, the patient's pain kept getting worse and spread from the feet to the knees and the hips and the patient could no longer stand for long times because of this pain. And then a year later, they finally received our Pompeii diagnosis. Now, unfortunately, when this patient came to visit us in Boston, it was clear that they were still experiencing a lot of pain. And you can imagine at such a young age, growing up from five years old until 11 years old, experiencing a lot of pain all the time has a huge impact on your life. From performance in school to playing with and making friends, this child was constantly in pain. So when we asked the patient about their pain, it became clear that it was very persistent and painful with pain lasting throughout the whole 14 days prior, with unusual, um, uh, a continuous pain as well, and a pain that lasts for most of the day. So very debilitating. Now we also administered the self-reported questionnaire batteries. And we saw that this patient has increased psychological and physical stress but reduced cognitive, physical, and social functioning. So compared to the normative mean that we see here, this patient scores a lot higher on sleeping problems, psychological stress experiences, emotional distress, depressive symptoms, anxiety, and physical stress. Um, so we see that this patient is very much affected. Um, however, it's hard for us to see how much of these symptoms are due to the pain or due to other symptoms they experience that may be very closely related to their Pompeii diagnosis. So what we see for this patient is that there is a sort of cyclic mechanism where someone may present with chronic pain, maybe also cognitive and physical difficulties, um, basically due to the glycogen deposits that they have. And this can have a very big effect on one's experience and performance, for example, their social lives or performance in school or at work. And these um, effects could lead to more symptoms of depression or anxiety. And when someone has such a neurocognitive profile of feeling depressed or when presenting with other neuropsychiatric symptoms, it is very possible that they are more sensitive to pain. So this case really highlights the need for a well, greater understanding of pain generation and the identification of optimized pain treatment approaches in children, but also adults um, with late onset Pompeii disease or Pompeii disease in general, that can also be implemented alongside enzyme replacement therapy. So we do hope that our research will prompt a more holistic approach of treating Pompeii disease patients. Um, not just the direct um, symptoms that they may experience, but also the chronic pain that they may very well uh, be experiencing as well. So we have looked at the brain thus far, but we also want to see what happens in the muscles themselves. So a standard of care assessment often involves the MRI. So what do we see on the MRI when we look at muscles? Now, we can see that patients who have more severe disease show more infiltration of fat inside the muscle. And so this indicates unhealthy muscle. And here we are comparing three patients. The more severe disease they had, so also more trouble with their mobility, the more fat we see inside the muscle. So what we see in black right here, um, that's all muscle. 
And in this other patient, we see to we start to see white streaks, which is the fat. And in this last infantile onset patient right here, we see even more fat streaks. So to compare the fat infiltration in a more systemic way, we can measure the fat fraction on the scans by circling the muscle. And doing this gives us a value that we can then also more easily compare between patients and see how this might be related to their symptoms as well. So that's what happens with the MRI, but there's also an alternative the electrical impedance myography or EIM device that we see here. So the EIM is a lot more cost-effective than the MRI, but it's still very new technology. It's a very small instrument about the size of a computer mouse, and it provides a completely pain-free way to look at the muscle. So we can get data from um, what the muscle looks like on the inside. You don't feel anything happening and you don't have to lie completely still like in the MRI, but it can still inform us about the health of the muscle. And we already see some differences between healthy controls and patients here, mainly at the beginning of these graphs. But at a later stage, we wanna dive more into comparing all of the different muscles and also see how this compares to what we see on the MRI, but also with those motor tasks that we did, such as the grip strength. So, so far we are seeing very promising results. This is currently where we're at with our study. And we still want to enroll patients who are unable to come into Boston or use the MRI. And so we already had our first successful home visit about two to three weeks ago. And we also want to scan more infantile onset patients and continue our analyses of all the data, including an analysis of our urine and blood biomarkers, um, the HEX4 and CK, and also integrate all of these new findings with the other findings that we have. So I would like to thank all of the patients who have worked with us thus far as well as the rest of our team who make this research possible, including Sanofi Genzyme, who support this study. Now, if you have Pompeii disease yourself and you are interested in participating, please do not hesitate to reach out to us. And yeah, hopefully we can welcome you soon to our facilities at Boston Children's Hospital. And thank you all for attending this webinar. Thank you so much. That was um, very interesting. And I think a really new way of uh, looking at how we can study some of these um, endpoints and things that are going on. Uh, we already have a few questions. Um, the first one is, super interesting early analysis. What are the hypotheses to consider for why the cognitive performance in Pompe disease is down relative to early control, healthy control? Yes, that's a great question. Um, well, first of all, I think um, that the cognitive um, deficits that we see in these patients have already been established in other research uh, before, and also the glycogen deposits that these patients experience um, it not only in the rest of the body, but also inside of the brain could be a good reason why um, these people are, are um, also experiencing um, trouble with cognitive performance and maybe not in all domains. Um, that's why we want to look at specific subcategories of cognitive functioning well so that we can identify exactly where the problem is um, in the brain, but also which um, symptom domain, whether it's cognitive, um, just like the working memory or maybe just the attention problems and kind of extract in such a way which systems are affected, which systems are not, and also see how this may relate to um, the current biomarkers that are available, such as in blood or as in urine. Um, yeah, do you have anything to add to that, Jamin? Yeah, sure. I mean, I think you touched on, on this, but um, you know, one of the reasons why we set out to do this study was to identify, um, you know, clinical research tools or clinical biomarkers that enable an objective assessment of the cognitive deficits that many IOPD and LOPD patients report. So um, 
you know, that like our hypothesis going into the study was that um, these techniques would allow us to elucidate what's happening or the neurobiological underpinnings of the um, of the disease that relate to cognitive dysfunction. Um, and then, you know, I think in terms of why cognitive dysfunction might be occurring um, in IOPD and LOPD, I think that is a kind of a multi-dimensional type of process. It could be something that uh, starts one way every, very early on in disease, but then due to maladaptive processes, maybe it has a different meaning down the line or patients with later, you know, um, uh, symptom presentation. Th does that answer your question, Ryan? I assume it does. Yeah. Um, okay. And I wanted to add uh, one more thing that, that, um, uh, that Raquel touched upon, and that is we did do our first um, at-home study visit about two weeks ago, and that involves everything except the um, uh, everything except the MRI. And we did this because we understand and we appreciate that for many IOPD and LOPD patients, as well as their families or caregivers, traveling isn't the easiest thing to do, especially um, if you're coming from far, if you have to get on a plane, if you're you know having to come to Boston. So, you know, but we still feel that we could capture a lot of good solid data and learn a lot about the disease uh, by simply doing things um, at patients' homes. In other conditions, we've actually, um, uh, you know, did our studies in a hotel room suite. And so over the course of, you know, two day period, we were able to evaluate 20 some odd patients with a very ultra rare condition. So, you know, we're trying to, you know, think a little bit outside the box and, um, uh, you know, find ways to evaluate patients, get them engaged in research without overburdening them. Um, how affected were the patients that you've studied so far? So for instance, you mentioned collecting blood and urine, but are you also taking into account perhaps pulmonary function tests and mobility measures besides walking? Um, so Raquel, do you want to answer that? Sure, yeah, no problem. So I think for the patients that we've had come into Boston Children's Hospital, there was a very broad spectrum of how affected they were, ranging from severely affected to also those that maybe have only had their diagnosis for a couple of months or a couple of years. And so, um, yeah, we definitely see also with the single subject data, for example, on those motor tasks that we did that um, some did perfectly fine on some of the tasks while other had um, really big problems with performing these or were not even able to perform some of the tasks at all. So I think it's very interesting to also have that broad spectrum and see how this also relates to the biomarker levels. And um, I think other than that, we also, you know, obtain a lot of their medical history um, so that we can always go back and look at more detailed descriptions of um, their uh, performances too, and not just when they're visiting us as a snapshot capture, but um, also just how they progressed over time as well. Um, so another question that's come in is, have you spoken with the folks at JHU who are looking at MRI glycogen de detection techniques? That technique could be an interesting layer to add to the idea that the performance may scale with glycogen storage. Um, the short answer is we have not. Um, we have so many components of our study already. Um, and we just, uh, we didn't, you know, we could always add and we have added things here and there. Um, but we just want to be mindful that you know, while some, we want to be able to do um, a set number of assessments across all patients and try to keep that as constant as possible. The more you add on, 
the the you know more of a burden it can be for patients um and you know we don't want to disrupt the feasibility of the study at a higher level but no that's um, a very interesting question but we just haven't done it just yet um you mentioned that you're still enrolling patients yeah how many more are you hoping to enroll and you know how many iopd how many lopd or just first come first serve Yeah, um, on the enrollment side, we definitely would love to enroll more IOPD patients. Um, as Raquel mentioned early on in her presentation, uh, we have one IOPD patient so far. Um, and, and you know, I, I hope that doing measurements, for example, at the patient's home or in more patient-friendly uh, locations that can enable us to enroll more IOPD patients. Um, the nice part about the techniques such as FNIRS, EIM, what have you, these are very low cost, cost effect and, and portable methods. So, you know, I think that enables us to enroll even up to say 15 or so IOPD patients alone. And I think that's what we targeted. But right now we're trying to just get as many patients as possible. So you're looking because for wanna... another 14 IOPD and how many more IOPD would you hope to enroll in an I ideal situation? I think at least 20. And the reason being, um, you know, we are at somewhat of a interim phase of our study right now. Mm -hmm. And um, I think, you know, if you have at least 20 patients, then you can start to apply some more rigorous st um, statistical analysis and you can really start to find out what is, um, you know, what, what is the main finding there and what is the most like robust finding in our study results. Um, another question that came in is, what are the recommendations for LOPD patients to strengthen their memory, cognition and improve depression and anxiety. Okay, do you uh -huh. want to take a stab at that first? Yeah, I'll, I'll do that. So for the exact recommendations, I don't know. I, I'm just guessing that as it is with everything, first of all, diet also plays a huge role in pulpit disease, as we know. So a lot of patients um, have to take this into account as well, but also to stay mentally active too. And, um, you know, the old saying, use it or lose it, definitely would apply to this too, um, as far as I'm concerned. And to improve depression and anxiety, I think it, this is also a very personal thing dependent on, um, you know, not just personal experiences, but also um, how disabled someone might be and how to deal with that. We've had I think patients come in who meditate a lot, who used to suffer from depression a lot. And through meditation and the right therapy, we're able to overcome this and doing a lot better nowadays. And I think those would be also my personal recommendations. Yeah. I, I think on the issue of um, depression and anxiety, the first thing to do is talk to your primary care physician or your treating physician. And... Uh, find ways to improve your overall mental health uh, or emotional health. Um, because it, yeah, apart from Pompe disease, we know that if you have better emotional health, then you you know that can impact your cognitive ability. Um, the, and of course, when you have a chronic illness, um, you know, such as Pompe disease, the pathological mechanisms of the disease itself can um, impact your cognition. So what, I'm, what we're trying to say is that it's kind of a multi-pronged approach that you need to take to improve your cognitive and your emotional health. Um, thank you. I think that was very thorough answer. It's very helpful because you're right. I think a lot of times you know, you only go see your specialist when something should be handled by a GP, that not everything is necessarily only tied to Pompeii. 
there could be other factors at play. Um, yeah, living with the living, you know, I don't have to tell anyone here this, but living with the chronic illness mm -hmm. can be very challenging um, from multiple perspectives. Um, and, and, and so, you know, getting the proper mental health for, for that, if that's something you're struggling with, is something you should do, right? And mm -hmm. hopefully by addressing any kind of unfortunate mental health issues you might be experiencing, you can improve other aspects of your life. So um, at the, towards the end of your presentation, you talked about the effect of pain and the need for pain management. Um, have you correlated that with any of the patients outside of that case report? Um, so for instance, the one IOPD and the nine LOPD you've already studied, were there any reports of pain within that group? Because um, speaking from experience and talking with other patients, it can definitely be a factor for some patients and it can be very hard to manage. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so we have, we do monitor pain or we do measure pain in all of our uh, study participants using a simple, you know, um, clinical questionnaire. Um, our group and others have actually written about pain in Pompe disease mm -hmm. um, and about its prevalence, its severity. Um, and, you know, we can circulate some manuscripts on that if helpful. Um, but it's, it is something that we're looking at here. And maybe what we could do once we have our full study cohort is to understand, say, the interactions between cognitive function and pain severity, right? Because we know that those two could be tightly correlated. Yeah, I think that'd be very interesting. And yes, definitely. Any um, studies and published uh, material, please pass along and we can include mm -hmm. it on the website mm -hmm. with this webinar. Yeah, we'll, we'll do that. Mm -hmm. um, are there any further questions? It seems like that might be it for the moment. Um, and so I want to thank you both very much for a very um, informative uh, presentation. I think it's something very unique to what we're used to talking about in terms of cognition and pain. Um, oh, I'm sorry, there was one further question. Oh, thank you. For the participants. Um, and I echo that, echo that. Thank you very much. And so with that, this concludes today's AMDA webinar. And I want to thank everybody for participating. Have a great thank day. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you. Have a nice day. Bye-bye.